America That's has their fights on Facebook Live in China and Iran, and everybody's watching us saying, look at these idiots telling us exactly their marital issues. China gave us the virus. The free world right now is giving us the vaccine. And the way you divide people is typically you say, see that group of folks over there? They're the ones that you're supposed to be afraid of. And I'm going to protect you. Israel invaded Lebanon in 2006. I was part of the contingent Marines that evacuated all the Americans out of the embassy there. Countries that stayed core to what they stand for, Russia, China, India, whatever, maybe they're like, no, this is what we're all about. You don't like it. Leave this place. Versus America, I was like, well, you don't like it? Well, let us change for you. I think you can't understand the United States as it exists today unless you understand the American Civil War. People are trying to cancel each other, destroy each other's livelihoods because of a difference of agreement. In the 60s, you had a counterculture movement. The counterculture has become the culture. If you're a Patriots fan, you're probably a Republican. You know, right. it's, it's like becoming like... My seven-year-old shouldn't be thinking about the politics of his movies or his TV ads yeah. or... The United States has had to figure out how to be the United States and constantly reinvent itself before. But we're in one of those moments right now, and if we don't figure it out... My guest today has a resume that can probably land him a job anywhere, but he chose to be a writer. And when you hear about his resume, you're going to say, this makes sense. Let me get right into it. So Elliot Ackerman uh, is an American author, but he's also former White House fellow and Marine, served five tours of duty in Iraq, Afghanistan, where he received the Silver Star, the Bronze Star for Valor, and a Purple Heart. With that being said, my guest today, Elliot Ackerman. Elliot, how are you? Good. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, it's good to have you on. Obviously, look, you're on your sixth book and you uh, uh, whatever you write does very well. New York Times bestsellers and your recent one that you wrote, which is the one I would want to focus on, is uh, a title uh, 2034, a novel of the next world war, which has a lot to do. I think China's involved. Iran's involved. It's fair to say it's some cybersecurity. It's a different kind of a war than what we're used to, but I'm really curious to get into, especially with somebody who chose to leave the military to want to go into right. So if you don't mind taking a moment uh, for those who don't know you, Elliot, give us your background uh, to get a little bit of context there, and then we'll go into the book. Yeah, sure. Um, well, as you alluded to, you know, I'm a former uh, Marine Corps officer. I uh, came into the Marine Corps out of college in 2003, which was the year we invaded Iraq. So that was sort of an interesting year to be a newly minted Marine infantry officer. Uh, I served in Iraq. I served uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit. I served in Hurricane Katrina when Israel invaded Lebanon in 2006. Uh, I was part of the contingent of Marines that evacuated all the Americans out of the embassy there. Then I went to special operations where I served in and out of Afghanistan from 2008 to 2011. Uh, and then I did a year working at the White House. Um, but uh, I've always been a reader. I'm actually the son of a writer, so I'd always been around other writers. Um, so the, you know, the idea of making that career transition didn't seem as strange as it might sound at face value. And so started uh, writing both novels, but I also write journalism as well. So uh, when I left the White House, I went to, I lived in Turkey for a number of years where I covered the Syrian civil war uh, for places like uh, the New Yorker, Esquire magazine, and I've been in and out of Iraq uh, as well as a journalist. Uh, and so oftentimes, you know, I write no and I write novels and often my novels are, are informed by the experiences that I've had. Uh, who were you in high school about? If I'm in 10th grade with you, who, who was Elliot Ackerman in high school? You know what? It's funny that you had asked that. So... I was not the upstanding citizen you see before you today. I was a slacker, skater kid, kind of squeaking by with, you know, high C's, low B's, didn't like school that much. Um, but was always actually sort of art, kind of artistically inclined. Interesting. So what's funny is, so the people, you know, people who see me say like, isn't that odd? You had this military career and then you wound up in the arts as a writer. The people who've known me the longest will say, yeah, it makes sense to us that you're a writer. We always thought it was kind of weird that you ran off and joined the Marines for eight years. So uh, listen, I think all of us, right? Like, you know, the poet Walt Whitman says we contain multitudes. So we all have, you know, different parts of our personalities that we're engaging during different chapters of our life. So, um, so as a writer, I kind of, you know, engage in the arts more than, you know, the parts of my personality that were more organizational that I engaged in when I was in the military. So what, did you always know you were going to be in the military? Or if you didn't, what was the tipping point when you said, I'm going to go join the Marines? 
you know, I always suspected. Like, so I was, I, you know, I grew up abroad. So I spent, uh, I was born in Los Angeles. I moved to London when I was nine years old. Mm-hmm. And just sort of, just even being in London, like, I think that gave me an appreciation for what it means to be an American, kind of how our society is a little bit different. Um, that made me want to serve. Um, you know, I wanted a job when I got out of college uh, where I'd have a lot of responsibility. And, uh, you know, the Marine Corps certainly gives you that. I can't think anywhere else where, at, you know, 22 years old, they put you in charge of 45 people. Um, you know, and I was also that kid who like never stopped playing with his GI Joes. So you kind of combine all that together and yeah. it leads me to go off and join the military. Was the admiration there of your father for you to want to be a writer as well? Or was it something that you just, you had the creative side where eventually you were going to end up writing and maybe one of your siblings didn't? Well, it's interesting. Listen, I've been first tell you, like, you know, when you just, when I first started writing, uh, you know, I was doing it very quietly. Like I had another job kind of you know, I'd carved out time to do it each day because at first saying, you know, I want to be a writer, like it sounds kind of silly, right? It's like saying, you know, I want to dance, you know, like it seems like no one's going to take you seriously. You have nothing to show for it. So, um, so I did it quietly. And then I, uh, you know, I started demonstrating some success and uh, was able to kind of transition into that career. What's cool is both you and your wife are writers, right? Yes. Yeah. My wife is a screenwriter and an I and a very, and a great novelist. Yeah, and she. What was the screenplay she did with um, uh, uh, Mark Wahlberg? Right with uh, Mile Twenty Two, I think. If I'm if I'm not mistaken. Oh, you're right. Yeah, she uh, she wrote the screenplay for uh, his film uh, Mile Twenty Two, which was directed by uh, Pete Burke. I mean, that's respect. So both of you are you guys always collaborating? So, babe, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Here's the character. Does this visual? Do you, can you see this? Does this look realistic, or is it just independently not uh, telling each other what you're working on? No, I, I know what she's working on. Um, we work very differently. You know, I, um, so she reads all my stuff. She's like typically my first reader when I finish a book or if I'm working on stuff. Uh, but we work differently in that, you know, when I approach my work, I'm very much, I guess it's the Marine in me. I sit down at my desk every day and I know what I'm going to do. And I'm going to write my thousand words today, whether I got to like put my head through the computer screen to do it. And she, will be kind of, you know, I, she's very brilliant. Like she'll be walking around looking like she's, you know, cooking or doing something around the house. And she won't seem like she's working for days or sometimes even weeks. And then she'll sit down and she'll write, you know, 40 pages in a burst. And I, and for her, it's like, she's working it out in her head for a long time. So we, we work in different ways. Very cool. Okay. So let's talk about, by the way, that's what you call a power couple within the same industry. I mean, you know, God knows what the upside is with that and what kind of projects you guys are going to come up with, let alone with the kind of a resume you already have. So future looks bright for the Ackerman and the Carpenter family. So let's let's talk about 2034, a novel of the next world war. Can you paint a picture of what the story of 2034 is where uh, the viewer who hasn't read your book or doesn't know much about it, what the premise of the book is? Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, the premise of the book is the the novel imagines what it would look like if the United States and China went to war primarily at sea in the aforementioned year. So maybe let me let me give you kind of a quick tour of the books. First, so someone who hasn't read it, so you'll know what's going on. So when the book opens, there, there's five primary characters. So when the book opens, you meet the first one, and that is Commodore Sarah Hunt. And you see her on the bridge of her destroyer, and she is on what's called the Freedom of Navigation Patrol. These are patrols we run in the South China Sea today because the Chinese claim the entire South China Sea as territorial waters. It's a body of water that's half the size of the continental United States. So we see her on one of these patrols and she spies a, what looks like a fishing trawler on fire in the South China Sea. She goes to investigate and when she gets there, she realizes that it's anything but a run of the mill fishing trawler on fire. Then we cut to the other side of the world. You meet the second principal character and that is Marine Major Chris Wedge Mitchell. His call sign is Wedge because a wedge is the world's oldest and simplest tool. And he's flying his state-of-the-art F-35 Joint Strike Fighter above the Straits of Hormuz when the controls of that plane literally stop responding to him and the aircraft diverts into Iranian airspace on a glide path down to Bandar Abbas Airfield. Now I cut to the White House and you meet the, fi- the third principal character of the five, which is Dr. Sandy Chowdhury. He is a first generation Indian American and he is the deputy national security advisor at the White House. And as he's trying to make sense of these two crises that are all unfolding, the one in the South China Sea and the one above the Straits of Hormuz, his telephone rings. And the other end of the line is the fourth principal character of the book, Admiral Lin Bao, 
and he is the Chinese military attache to the United States. And he has a message for Sandy Chowdhury, which is that those two events are not unrelated and the Chinese are sick and tired of the US sending these freedom of navigation patrols into the South China Sea. The South China Sea is their, is their territory. At which time there's a massive cyber attack on the United States. Basically the lights go out and they come back on. You know, the whole Eastern seaboard is basically blinked. And that's basically the end of the first chapter of the book. And I mentioned there are five characters. The fifth you meet at the beginning of the second chapter, and that is Brigadier General Qasim Farshad, a veteran of the Iranian Quds Force, a consummate uh, forever warrior. He'd fought in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, places where I fought, but on the opposite side. And when Wedge lands on that airfield, the guy who's waiting to interrogate him is Farshad. So you meet these five characters, and really through their eyes, you enter the world of 2034. You know, in which we're seeing all of these nations march off uh, into a cataclysm of war. So when you're coming up with these characters, how many of these characters are uh, people in your life that you've met? How many of them are people that at some point there was a, like Ghassam Soleimani? Like, is it a comparison to like the general of there? Or, you know, how many of them are real characters that you're kind of a, uh, because the book is a fiction book, but it also seems extremely realistic. You know what I mean? It's not like you're reading a fiction. You're kind of looking at the same this is kind of believable, you know, when you're writing a book like this. So how much of your creative mind was somebody you met or somebody that's in the market today as a leader? Well, Mike, you said my creative mind. My creative mind is like an associative mind, right? So when I'm sitting there, I'm, you know, yeah. trying to build these characters. You know, I'm pulling in all sorts of, you know, all sorts of stuff, like things that have happened to me. Oh, Wedge, he's sort of, maybe he reminds me of this guy I once met, you know, on the USS Iwo Jima. And, you know, Kasim Farshad, he's like this one general I met. Like, you know, for instance... He's described as his hand, his right hand, he's missing two fingers. So he sort of has this claw. There's actually a very famous Marine Corps general uh, who was just, this guy was a Vietnam vet, tough as nails. He actually had the world push-up uh, record at one point. And he had, his hand was like that. He had two fingers blown off in Vietnam. And I just say like, that's just like a detail. Cause I was thinking of like, you know, what's Farshad like? He's probably like this general a little bit. And I remember that guy's hand and how that just sort of was you know, he could choke you to death with these three fingers. And I, you know, you want to convey that. So it's all of these little things oh, that you're kind cool. of bringing together to try to make the character feel real so that you can see that character as a reader. So right here, while I'm looking at the screen on this side, what I did is I pulled up evolution of wars, right? Like how we've gone to war, evolution of it. So it starts off with saying, you know, phase one, you know, bayonets, we got muskets, we got, uh, you know, uh, cannons, mortars. Then you got the naval ships showed up. Then you got machine guns, flamethrowers, poison gas, aircraft, tanks, atomic bomb. It's just kind of talking about the evolution, which is what we've kind of gone through. Recently, you've been hearing a lot about how, you know, uh, uh, U.S. historically, oh, we spent so much money on military, but we keep buying the same stuff that we went to war with maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago versus you got a China that they spend more money on cyber warfare, you know, bio warfare, a lot of different kind of uh, direction they're taking versus the way U.S. is spending that their resources. How different of a war is 2034 going to be than what we expect? Is it anything out of the ordinary in your mind, imagination, in your mind that you say, these are a couple of things that's going to happen that nobody's probably paying attention to today? I think it's important to point out, like 2034 is a cautionary tale. It's not a predictive of tale. Of course. In so much as we're not trying to predict the exact technology, but we're trying to show like this, these are the trends and you hit it, the evolution of war. So the one thing you always see is that, you know, one technology kind of overtakes another technology. And so oftentimes, you know, as Americans, we're sitting here and we're constantly trying to like refine our technology and we're spending all this money on new aircraft carriers and on new jets uh, and fighter planes. But we're not asking ourselves the questions like, is this the right technology to be investing in? And you see that in 2034, there's a massive cyber attack at the beginning of the book. And what that cyber attack does is it acts as a level, a leveler. So suddenly all these very high tech platforms we have, they don't work. Like you can't turn them on. So without spoiling anything in the book, I would tell you like when you meet Wedge, right? He is flying this state-of-the-art F-35 Joint Strike Fighter that doesn't work. The last time you see Wedge, he is piloting a generation one F-18 Hornet built like circa 1990 uh, on his final mission. It's got no technology in it. And so thematically, one of the, the issues the book wrestles with is 
how does technology work in a war? How do we advance, take advantage of technology and then have to sometimes use old technologies to outsmart our adversary? Essentially, are you saying that the modern technology is easier to hack into and tap into than the old technology? Yeah, it is. And sometimes the way you defeat technology is without technology. Like, can I give you an historical example? Please. Yeah. So like, um, I'm a history buff. One of the one of my favorite battles I've studied is the Battle of Agincourt, which was fought in 1415. It was made famous by William Shakespeare in the play Henry V. And at that battle, basically, a British force had invaded France. They were at the end of their supply lines, uh, ill-equipped, trying to get back to England, strung out when the entire French army assembled against them. This is like the cream of the French medieval nobility. And they were decked out on the battlefield of Agincourt, the French, with what was the most state-of-the-art technology at the time. And that technology was plate armor. They'd figured out how to fold steel into plates to make these knights like unstoppable. So the French knights come out there with their ex very expensive, technologically state-of-the-art plate armor. It rains the night before on that field, and they're gonna go destroy this ill-equipped, smaller English army. They go and charge across this field and they kind of get bogged down in the mud because their, their armor is so damn heavy. And the French and the English have a totally different technology that is far less, far less expensive. Um, and that's the longbow. And they shower down arrows on the French knights and just slaughter them. It's one of the greatest French military defeats of all times. That is an example of, yeah, you might have the most state-of-the-art technology in your plate armor or in your F-35 or your ford class aircraft carrier, but it's the wrong technology for the battle you're about to fight. What, what, okay, so let's, let's play on that because again, yes, it's fiction what you're writing, but let's face it, you're not like a guy who went to school and read all the books and then you write books about military and war. So yeah, you know, I just went to school, I read all these books. My dad was a veteran, but I've just, I'm fascinated by writing. No, no, you were in there. You, you got, you're decorated, you know, you got stuff that you have bronze star for valor, Purple Heart, Silver Star, you know, Special Ops. I mean, you've gone to the, you know, what is the Special Ops of Marines? I know in the Army, it's a, a Delta Force. Was, what is Special Ops? Yeah, I was a Marine Raider. Okay, got it. So so when you go at that point, you have to know you have some moral authority. And I'm assuming your friends are probably within the same community that maybe, you know, you don't disclose who the friends are and people that you talk to each other with. What direction do you think we are going right now? The, one of the things I researched the other day, which... I couldn't believe was how many military bases U.S. has in different countries and how many military bases China has. China, U.S. has some 800 military bases that we pay in 70 plus countries. China has one military base, and that's at the choke point of the Suez Canal. They don't mm -hmm. have that many military. So I sit down, I look at the cost. I'm like, why are we spending so much money trying to save everybody's marriage? Why are we spending so much money trying to be a hero to everybody? And we end up being a bad guy anyways, because anytime you're too involved in someone's marriage of trying to save it, what typically happens at the end? You're the bad guy, right? You're like, oh my gosh, she was too much involved. Versus China saying, look, instead of spending all this money here, we're going to keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. From the outside, many will say China hasn't yet passed U.S. up in having the strongest military. Navy, they have, we saw the stats about a month ago how they have more ships now than we have, and ours are old, theirs are more advanced, and they're messing money in naval ships to protect the southern part, which is what you're talking about. What is your biggest concern with China long-term? Well, I think, you know, my concern, um, you know, it's something, you, you know, if you, if you get into the book, you'll sort of see manifest in the scenario, is that we're preparing for the wrong type of war. And because there, there's so much momentum in terms of uh, the way we invest in certain platforms, and even how we as Americans imagine war, uh, it becomes very difficult for us to think about it in new ways, and we need to be thinking about it in new ways. Now, people are trying to do this. You know, my own service, the Mar you know, the Marine Corps is actually doing a pretty good job of this right now. They just got rid of all the tanks that used to exist in the Marine Corps. So like, we're not going to, Marines aren't going to be, if we're fighting in the South China Sea, we're not going to be using tanks. And they're trying to think about what like a 21st century island hopping campaign might look like if they, you know, if we needed to fight that fight. But it's very, very difficult because there is just so much inertia that exists in the platforms we're invested in, our force posturing, as you alluded to, 
and just in our our thought. Um, so I think you know, to me, that's the idea. Is, you know, what if we're preparing uh, for the wrong war? Uh, and I think I think those are you know those are questions that we need to be you know engaging with right now, and and some people are. You know the characters you have in your book, Sarah Hunt. You got Chris Wedge Mitchell, who was the one that's flying the F thirty five E. You have uh, 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 main countries you're touching up on, which is China, Iran, Russia, India. You know, India is one nation that China doesn't like a lot. They like to mock them a lot. You know, and they're kind of going back and forth. And India's got a younger crowd. China's a little bit older. They just increase the amount of babies a family can have because they're starting to realize they're getting older. So indirectly, they try to mock India, but they're worried about India because India's not playing the games of, oh, let TikTok and let this and let that. And India's like, no, you can't come in here. Modi kind of standing up a little bit to them. And then you have China who's bought Iran. They just signed a 25 or $400 billion contract. So, you know, kind of that take, that's taking place. And Russia's always going to be in the picture with the um, having the most nuclear, you know, warheads. I think they're at 10,300, whatever their number is. They're above everybody else. Uh, who, what role are these guys going to be playing in your book? In your book, let's play in the role sure. that they're going to be playing because you highlight a lot of different uh, uh, arrogance and miscalculations all nations make. You're not just kind of one of those books where you read where America sucks. You know they have no clue what they're doing. They've lost their edge. No, you're kind of calling it out in every possible way. Again, it is fiction. It's not a prediction. You're playing with ideas, right? But there's a part of it that's possible. What roles in your book uh, do you see, can you tell us, so the audience can know, U.S. plays, their miscalculations, China, Russia, and India, just to give us a glimpse. Not enough where we don't want to read the book, but enough for us to kind of get an idea. Well, I'll say, listen, the spirit of this book is like, there's no mustache twirling like villain in this book. You know, we want to make real characters. You know, I want these characters to feel real to you. So each of these characters, you know, when they step onto the page and you're reading you know, the sections that are told from their point of the point of view, you know, they're stepping onto that, they're on that page as though they're on a stage and they're making their case to you, the reader, as though you are God. Like, this is the world according to them. And so I think for like, you know, a guy like Sandy Chowdhury, who's working in the National Security Council, you know, he has, he he's concerned about many of the issues that, you know, we were just talking about, which is, you know, there is a story that America has been telling itself for generations now. And is that story really true? Or are we, you know, are, are we kidding ourselves and, and, and deluding ourselves as to the preeminent position we hold of leadership in the world? And he wrestles with that. And I, you know, I wrestle with that. I don't have answers, but those questions are framed throughout the book. So, you know, for America, it's sort of this idea of, you know, how do we, you know, how do we keep on being America? And does the, you know, and the one thing that makes America unique as a nation is like, we're not a blood and soil nation. You know, you can't, you know, I, I couldn't immigrate to China and become Chinese. You know, if you're Chinese, you can come to the United States, you can become a U.S. citizen, you're, you know, you're, you know, you're American. So that's how it works. And so that's unique. And what is it? And how does that idea fit into the long arc of the world? How does a society that is like ours, that is 245 years old, based around this idea or really ideal set of ideals, compared to a, a country like China that's thousands of years old and has a very different sense of itself. And when you get to the Chinese character, Lin Bao, I mean, you know, Lin Bao is a guy who um, has an interesting cachet in China and so much is, you know, he's a military attache, but he is of split American Chinese parentage. His mother was American, he's raised in China. And so within the Chinese regime, this makes him, you know, someone who uh, is very appealing because he, you know, he's able to understand the American okay, psyche. He's yeah. studied at Naval War College. Um, but he's distrusted by the Chinese as well. So he sort of is in this in-between space and he can understand both arguments and he's frustrated by what he perceives as American hubris, but he also sees some of the, you know, China's not 10 feet tall. He sees, you know, you mentioned the demographic weaknesses in China, uh, difficulties they have with transparency that you see playing out in the book and that we've just seen with COVID. I mean, you know, listen, like, you know, China gave us the virus. The free world right now is giving us the vaccines. And I think everyone should pause and remember that with the year we've gone through as we think about the role of China. Then you have Farshad, you know, with Iran. You know, what is the role of Iran uh, in this? You know, a, a, you know, a country that is, you know, in the Middle East trying to figure out its sense of itself, who it should be allied with. You see many shifting alliances, as you alluded to. And then we get to, you know, to Russia. I mean, the role of Russia in this book, and oftentimes it's just sort of as the joker. 
you know, they know that they are the strongest when everybody else is the weakest. So they don't want to see alliances and they behave, they, you know, they, they act out in ways that frankly don't really serve a larger strategic objective. They're just kind of screwing things up for everyone. So they can be basically like, you know, they're like, the way we win is we're the tallest midget. If anyone's taller than a midget, we don't, we lose. But if everybody's like at a midget level, we're the tallest midget. Yeah, that's makes sense. That's how Russia behaves in the book. So is it essentially like the, the, the typical uh, behind closed doors, never commit to anybody a hundred percent, you know, indirectly create more proxy wars, you know, uh, constantly stay out of it, yet enough inside where people need you, create opportunities where you're needed and you come out the hero. But at the same time, you know, if anybody wanted to face off against you directly, you would destroy them. And that's Russia. Yeah. I mean, listen, you know, like we talk about where the, where the, you know, where parts of the book come from, yeah. you know, I know, I think like one of the, I think a great uh, piece of filmmaking is um, the Nol Nolan's The Dark Knight. I mean, the Batman movie. And like Russia's the Joker in that movie, you know, and that that scene where he's talking about where the Joker is talking about, you know, I just want to throw a little chaos into the mix. You know, I'm like a I'm like a dog chasing a car. I wouldn't know what to do if I caught it. Like there's a lot of that informing Russia, how Russia behaves in this war. They know like they engage in behavior. So they know like, like we don't really know who this is going to benefit. We just know it's going to screw everything up for everyone. And that that will help us. Let, let me let me ask you a question. So. A part of what I'm asking you is your opinion. Obviously, at this point, if the reader wants to go and learn more about, you know, how you're presenting the book, we're going to put the link below for folks to be able to go buy it. It became an instant uh, New York Times bestseller. And uh, you ought to go read the book. It's not like it's being written by somebody that's a fiction writer that doesn't have the backing to uh, make it extremely realistic. But from your standpoint, where you're currently at uh, uh, and, and your opinion, who concerns you the most? I mean, obviously, you, you know, China's at the top where a lot of people say it's China. You got India that comes up. We just kind of figure out how you're presenting Russia to be. What should we be most worried about? Again, just a year ago, we've never had a shutdown in the U.S. It's never been like, hey, you got a shutdown for your California is barely coming out of it. Take the masks off. They came back out yesterday, two days ago, put the masks back on. Oh, no, no, you can take it off. We've never been through this. What are some other weird things like this that could happen? Like what happens to America and the world if a real cyber attack actually took place? What does that look like? What does life look like with that? Can you use a little bit of your creativity to say, you know, here's what concerns me. And if this does take place, this is what it will look like. Let me paint a picture for you. Yeah, I mean, well, you asked, you know, kind of who among all these state actors to me is the most concerning. Uh, and my answer would be us. I'm the most concerned about actually the United States and our ability to come together as a country and respond coherently in the way we have done throughout our history when there is a challenge that presents itself outside of our borders. And listen, and, um, you know, I remember how in after September 11th, you know, the entire country came together like this, you know, very quickly. And before the pandemic, and, and I'm not saying this in any type of partisan way. Uh, I'm, I'm exhausted by all the partisanship, but I'm just sitting, but I can tell you, you know, many times sitting with friends at dinner over a drink, pre-pandemic kind of wondering, you know, as, as our society just was keeping getting more and more divided, like, hey, you know, I wonder if there was like a 9-11 type attack, you know, if there was a real existential crisis in the United States, like we'd be able to come together like we did in the days after September 11th. And talking about that with friends, and like the pandemic presented that type of a crisis. I mean, there's 600,000 dead Americans right now based off of this pandemic. And 2020, I think, was is the most divisive year we've had since 1968. That does not bode well for the United States. The, um, you know, I'm being a little facetious here, but I've always said, like, you know, like the strength of the United States, like, we're kind of like jazz hands. You know, like, we got all sorts of crazy stuff going on. Like, people are doing this, they're doing that, you know, diverse, million, that's great. And that's a fantastic way to be. And you can only be diverse like this if, when the moment comes, you can take your jazz hands and you can put them into fists when you need to. And if you can't put them into fists, you're going to get punched right in the nose. And what concerns me right now is this, you know, the country with, you know, just the, 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 the division that we see, the fact that we, you know, there's, there's so few things we all agree upon um, that the greatest threat posed to the United States to me seems to be ourselves and our inability to get our act together. You think it's going to happen? So, okay, so let's go there. So let's go a layer below that. What's caused this divisiveness? Who's who's dividing and what's the benefit to them to divide? 
so many things. I think you're just seeing a perfect, you know, there's like a perfect storm. Uh, I don't think you can say, oh, there's like one cause, you know, like, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say like, oh, it's, you know, Donald Trump or, oh, it's Nancy Pelosi or, you know, no, it's a perfect storm. You know, our media, you know, I think, listen, the way our media works right now, um, you know, where people are incentivized to be extreme. That's how you get attention. Attention gets you followers, followers get you money, it gets you voters. You know, I think that that certainly plays into the divisiveness. If we look at how our elections are run right now, you know, with, you know, with our primary system that kind of incentivizes people who are out on the fringes as well. Uh, I, you know, I think that is, that's a challenge. You know, the amount of money that's in politics has been a, been a challenge. Demographic change in the United States, you know, we're facing huge demographic changes that we have to figure out how to navigate through that. You know, all these things are happening and, you know, they've happened before. I mean, the United States has had to like figure out how to be the United States and constantly reinvent itself um, before. But we're in one of those moments right now. And if we don't figure it out, like it's, you know, it's, it's not just a given that we figure it out. How do you figure it out? Though? I mean, you have to realize we have a lot of smart people in this country, right? We have, we have a lot of people. When you, when you read the book, there's a book, Barbarians to Bureaucrats. The author, Lawrence Miller, talks about the fact that every society, organization, company goes through certain phases. First, you got the prophet, which is the founding fathers. Like, hey, here's an idea of America. We're going to go away from Britain, and this is what we're going to do. Then you got the barbarians. These are guys that are willing to go to war and fight and do the dirty work. They get the scars, you know, all this dirty things that happens to them, but they handle it. They're not afraid. Then you have the builders and explorers, which is the industrial age. We build trade, we build trains, you know, hotels, buildings, all this stuff. Then shows up the administrators, the lawmakers, then the bureaucrats, then the aristocrats, and they screw the whole thing up. We're in the bureaucrat and this aristocrat phase right now, but it says in order to save it and prevent this from happening, you need a synergist or a group of synergists. Who is a synergist today? And, and does this climate give birth to a synergist? Who would you call a synergist today? I mean, because when you're saying we got to figure out a way to bring it together, we are hearing that, but who can do that today? Is it even possible to do that today? I don't know. I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't have, I don't have an answer. I agree. I agree. You know, I think there's a lot of credence to the, to the template that you just laid out, uh, laid out there. Uh, and I think, you know, the contribution I'm just trying to make is to is to call greater attention to those types of arguments, like that this is the challenge of today. Like it's, you know, if if someone's telling you that this this one political figure is the reason why, and you know, this individual is the reason why we're having all these problems, uh, I would say, you know, you're you're not seeing the forest past the trees. I mean, you know, this there are bigger things afoot. So I think the first step is just for having your your thinking straight on where we're at in this in this longer cycle. Um, but I don't have one single prescriptive thing we can do to cure all of our societal ills at this moment. It's, it's crazy. Like your answer, you know, you, you said, I don't know. I'm just giving out my perspective and, you know, and let the you know audience make a decision for themselves. There are so many uh, uh, people who are decorated, smart, intellectual, resume, moral authority to who can do something about it. I'm not, not pinning it on you. I'm just saying there's many of us that can do something about it. But there's almost this, and I, I, I hope, call me out, just trash my argument, whatever I say to you. Say, Pat, I disagree with you. There's almost this feeling of, yeah, I know what's going to happen if I try to play the synergist. They're going to trash me. They're going to this. No, no, you do it. No, no, I think you should do it. No, no, you do it. No, you do it. I think you ought to do it. I think you, I'm just giving you my perspective. Now you do it. There are so many people afraid right now walking on eggshells to go talk about that stuff because what if you lose your clout? What if you seem like you are too far left or too far right or too far this or too far? I don't want to yeah. be put on the box, you know? So it seems like a lot of influencers who can do something about it feel like they're walking on eggshells and they don't want to do anything because their career may be ruined. What do you think about that? I think it's certainly true. Listen, I don't count myself among those. Like I'm writing books, I'm writing columns, you know, every day and I'm, I'm saying what I'm saying. And if you don't like it, then, you know, screw you, you don't like it. So, um, I don't feel like I myself am walking necessarily on, on eggshells, but I feel like, yeah, I feel like people are, and there's a, there's definitely an intimidation game that's going on. Uh, I, I would certainly say that I think, you know, leadership helps. I don't know that, you know, waiting around for like one, you know, the perfect presidential candidate who's going to pull us out of all, you know, I, I think that's, you know, I think you're going to be waiting a long time for that. Yeah. Um, 
but I think, listen, I think cultural, I think they're, you know, I'm hopeful that our culture will become less, less tolerant of the, you know, censorious, the, the string of censoriousness that has kind of sprung through it in which people are trying to kill each other, cancel each other, destroy each other's livelihoods because of a difference of agreement. I think those people, uh, you know, who behave that way are none of things and, uh, and pariahs. And, you know, we need to be able to disagree with one another and, and move on. Uh, and for some reason, we've gotten past that. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sing that to the rooftops. You said uh, uh, we haven't been this decisive, I think you said since 1968. I think that's the year you said 1968. Yeah. Uh, uh, are you saying like post Barry Goldwater, the whole, you know, is that, is that kind of where you're going or 1968? Which, which part of 1968? Yeah, yeah civil rights, Vietnam. Uh, and I think this is in many ways worse than 68 um, because unlike 68, you know, you see our institutions are are right in the mix of all of this being torn apart. You know, in, in the 60s, you had a counterculture movement. And then you kind of had our institutions able to still function while there was this like, you know, really divisive counterculture movement going on. Um, and, you know, some elements of the counterculture were absorbed into institutions and, you know, metabolized. Uh, I think right now what you're seeing is, uh, you know, the counterculture has become the culture. And uh, there's, there's, there, the, and the institutions are pulling in wildly different directions. And so there's like no, there's no, there's no middle, there's no center to stand on anymore. Yeah. So, so when you, when you're talking about that earlier, you said, you know, how uh, uh, if you think about a person going from here to China, you know, uh, uh, you don't become Chinese. But if a Chinese person comes over here, you can become American. I'm from Iran. I lived there 10 years. I lived in Germany two years. I'm Armenian, a Syrian born in Iran, but I came here. I consider myself an American today, right? So did, did, uh, did America lose its core culture and ideals by trying to make it so inclusive by letting everybody in here where we lost our fabric, what this was founded on, because everybody's like, I don't agree. I don't agree. I don't agree. So they try to appease and try to please everybody else that wants to change it. Or, and then some of these countries that stayed core today to their, you know, what they stand for, Russia, China, India, whatever, maybe they're like, no, this is what we're all about. You don't like it. Leave this place versus America. like, Oh, you don't like it? Well, let us change for you. Do you think we've lost a little bit of our, you know, uh, what we were founded on or no? Again, I think it's a little bit of a perfect storm. I think, listen, I think the one, one of the challenges that we face is, you know, if you, and I'm speaking now really kind of about politics, yes. uh, I believe that you can define politics in the fighting way. You know, politics is the acquisition or maintenance of power. Can we agree that's like a general overarching sure. yeah. higher or maintain power? Yeah. That's what politics is. So there's two ways to do that, right? You can unite people, which I would argue is like very difficult to do to really just unite people. Um, like maybe Obama did it in 2008. He, he didn't do it in 2012. Like, you know, I'm just looking for recent examples. Or you can do what most politicians do is they divide people. And the way you divide people is typically you say, you know, you see that group of folks over there. They're the ones who are causing you the problems. They're the ones that you're supposed to be afraid of and i'm going to protect you from them and that's the thing fear you know fear is how we divide one another and so i think so many americans now are incited to fear and we have a political class that continues to incite people to fear incite them to rage and play on these emotions because those are emotions are a way of not only acquiring or maintaining political power they are ways of acquiring or maintaining cultural power economic power Fear, 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 fear. It's everywhere and it's killing us. Yep. And so, you know, do, have we veered away? I mean, you know, uh, sure. Like, are there are there people right now in the United States who are saying that the demographic, the demographic changes that are occurring in this nation are a reason to be afraid? Yeah, of course. And there are politicians who are making a lot of hay out of that. And then I would argue there are politicians on the other side who are making hay out of people coming here saying, you know, you're never going to be accepted by the United States. Our country is fundamentally and forever flawed with racism and it doesn't work and it's horrible from its founding. And that's just, you know, they're just photographic negatives of the same image, inciting people to fear in order to either acquire or maintain their power. So, so you just like, you got to see the con, yeah. like see the con. And if you see the con, you don't play into it. So, so, the, so then the question, but you know how it is. I mean, if you want to do that, it's so easy to control a, a an audience who is not, you know, they don't spend their time studying the different sides of the argument and the history of what took place, what percentage of the country reads books after they graduate from school or college and say, hey, let me go study more history instead of reading romance novels or watching Netflix. 
And I'm, you know, I just think the certain level of naivete that we have uh, to think that the the average voter is going to be able to spend the additional time to get deeper in these issues. As as a historian yourself, who you've read, I, I can only imagine. Like visually, I went to your kitchen table, sitting to your dad, sitting and talking to your dad. I bet you've had some of the most incredible conversations with your dad and your family. Like I wonder, like Thanksgiving must have been a must have been a pretty cool Thanksgiving center. What do you think? Obviously, you do some sports, all that stuff. But there's depth in the conversations, right? And you're a historian. You've read a lot of different books. From your thoughts, historically, what has been the DNA or what a synergist has looked like that have brought us together? Not the fear guy, not the divide guy or gal. From your, and maybe you say, I don't know, Pat, I, I, I don't know if I can think of anybody. But if there is a DNA of somebody that you've seen, say the audience is listening to this, and we have a lot of different types of audience that listens to this, entrepreneurs, investors political people, athletes, those who watch our kind of content that we have. What has been the DNA of somebody that's brought America together? That's, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I think you can't understand the United States as it exists today unless you understand the American Civil War. You know, I'm endlessly fascinated by the American Civil War because it's such a, it's such a point of departure from what the country was before to what it kind of becomes after it. And I think that when you study and, you know, as I've studied and like learned about the civil war, um, the thing that kind of strikes me time and again is, you know, Lincoln's like vision of the country is a really, it's a radical vision just in so much as it's, it's a departure in many, many ways of what many people viewed the country as pre-civil war. Um, you know, if you look at the primary historical test before the Civil War, the United States uh, are always referred to as these United States, right? Like they're a plural. The United, you know, these United States are these United States, and then it becomes after the Civil War the United States, singular, uh, and that is sort of a radically different vision of what this country was from its founding. So, you know, when he's sitting there in like 1861 and 1862. And the arm, you know, the the Union Army is getting the snot beaten out of it by the Confederacy, and things aren't looking too great. You know, the fact that he kind of holds that course, I think, is you know, it's it's remarkable. And uh, and there are many moments if you want to play the alternate historian, where you can go into the Civil War and see how you know maybe that one breaks differently, and you know, the South is able to secede from the Union, and we have a totally different country. So for someone who like brings the brings the nation together in the way that he's able to do it, there was. There was no trend he was sort of following. I mean, he had the vision and, you know, against a lot of very difficult odds, was kind of crap, was, you know, weaving out of whole cloth what this country was kind of kind of wind up being in the 20th century. Yeah, that's what they consider him possibly the greatest of all time. Yeah. No guy exactly. that the show guy and, and and by the way he doesn't come across as a weak guy he doesn't come across as guys let's just get along can we all just listen to barney and you know love each other and i don't see him as a guy like that i see him as a firm guy that could stand up to opposition but still was able to you know make a case for his argument and still unite and not compromise certain set of values and principles the question becomes is the current marketplace set up for something like that to happen while we have so many enemies who are happy to see us divided versus united that's the question yeah and again i think it comes a little bit into like you got to be able to recognize the con as it's happening you know if, like you know one of one of the great challenges we face right now is that our adversaries understand how they can leverage information news and really just divisiveness into the U.S. system to basically turn us all inward on one another so we can't yeah. pay attention to anything that's happening outside of our borders. So I, I was in Aruba the other, uh, last yesterday, I just, I took a couple hundred of my guys to Aruba. We're having a good time. We're having a conversation one at night. And I said, you know, what's one of the biggest problems with America right now. They said, what? I said, I said, you ever had a very bad fight with your wife or your husband that if people saw it, like it would be pretty embarrassing. Yeah. I said, if your worst top 10 worst fights were public and somebody didn't like you, could they figure out a way to divide your marriage even more? Of course. How would they use it? You think there's an ex or a brother-in-law or a cousin or somebody or a friend that's jealous and envious that would love to see you guys get a divorce yet? I said, the last thousand fights America's had with its husband and wife has been on Facebook Live. That's what America's been doing. 
America has their fights on Facebook Live in China and Iran, and everybody's watching us saying, look at these idiots telling us exactly their marital issues. Let's divide them even more. Um, but it's, a, it's part of the system that we have in U.S. We are very easily tearing, telling, say, uh, you got the left and the right, put a husband and wife. One of them is a husband, one of them is a wife, whatever. Just left wing, right wing, right? Let's just look at it as a wing. Oh, if I'm China, if I'm Iran, if I'm Russia, I'm sitting there saying, look at these fools. They just gave us the next 38 moves. Look at these guys. We know how to control those guys. Give them this. That guy's broke. Give him money. That guy's driven by power. Give him power. That guy's driven by this. Did you see what he said about him? Go disclose what he said more about them. Oh, wow. We found more. Go get a couple of hackers working on this. Um, and, and by the way, I don't know if that's going to change because the system, it's, it's a systematic thing. What, how are you going to change? That's the approach of free press, free debate, free this, free that. So everybody can see our problems that we're having against each other. What are your thoughts on that? I agree. I think that's psycho, you know, psychologically, I think for many, you know, many Americans who are not, who are not staunch partisans one way or the other, which, oh, by the way, is the, you know, the plurality of Americans in the United States right now and the high 40% identifies political independence. You know, they don't identify with either party. So for all of those Americans, I think psychologically, you know, we're living the equivalent of being like the children in some household where the, you know, horrible household where the parents are like crazy abusive to each other and refuse to divorce. And so like every day we come home and they're screaming and, you know, dad's telling you like your mom is da, 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 and mom's saying that dad's da, da, da. and it's, you know, psychologically it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's very, very jarring and American political life kind of is, you know, the equivalent right now of, you know, Hatfields versus McCoy's or Capulets versus Montague's. And, you know, if you look at that play, like, you know, Capulets and Montague's that's, uh, you know, Romeo and Juliet, the last line of Romeo and Juliet uh, that Shakespeare writes uttered by, you know, the prince, um, the prince says, uh, see what a scourge kills your loves with hate. And then he says, all are punished. And then he screams it again. All are punished. And I feel like that's that's going to be our epigraph when we finish this kind of partisan warfare. Like, all are punished. You think someone's going to win? Of course. No one wins. No, of course. We're revealing all of it to the world. And we, we yeah. I'll give you an idea. This morning we're doing podcasts. And this is what I was going to show you. I'm sitting there. I have a story. Novak Djokovic says he might refuse to be vaccinated against the coronavirus because the world's number one is opposed to vaccinations. Okay. And he just won his 20th, 20th grand slam. Da, 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 he's a argument, maybe the greatest of USA today. He's the greatest of all time, better than Federer, better than Sampras, better than all this stuff. I can't tell that story on YouTube. You know why? I read the story of Beasley a couple of weeks ago where Beasley said why he's not taking you know, going to do a forced vaccination, whatever. That's his opinion. I just read on Twitter. We got to strike for it. So the point I'm trying to make to you is it is a form of Gatsad. I had him on last week. He said it's a form of self-censorship where you sit there and you're like, uh, it's better I don't say no. nothing right now because there's consequences behind it, right? So the, 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 as much as I want to believe a synergist can come out and do it, but that synergist has to be able to go up against the major virtual governments that we have to be able to say, let me say my thoughts. You don't like it. Let 10,000 comments underneath it disagree with me. Let somebody create a reaction video saying Patrick's content is trash. I don't agree with what he says about capitalism or money or business. And then let people make a decision for themselves rather than, nope, you can't even say, let me silence you. So it, it, it makes it tough for synergists to be born in a silenced environment. And a democracy can only exist when there is a free marketplace of ideas and, you know, and, and, and a, a general ability to understand on a certain set of facts. Like, listen, like, you want to have a virus, you know, COVID vaccines? Like, I think it's totally, it's totally reasonable. If you have a vaccine where all the data is that exists is this doesn't affect young kids. And someone's going to tell you, you got to get, you know, we're going to get your like eight year old a vaccine and it doesn't affect them. And these vaccines haven't been approved by the FDA that someone would pause and say, you know what, like, I'm going to take a beat. Maybe I don't want to do that for my child. Like that seems reasonable and we should be able to debate that and people should be able to make a choice on that. But what, what, you know, what we're seeing right now is the politicization of everything. That shouldn't be a political stance. The, you know, the way countries become deeply dysfunctional is when politics seeps into every crevice of your life. So everything you do has a political bias and you cannot be free of politics at all. It's oh, very goodness. insidious and we're there. I can't, I mean, I can't think of anything that doesn't have a, some type of political bias sure. in the United States right now. 
like video, you got uh, sports, politics, movies, politics, uh-huh. Hollywood, video games. Politics. Like, everything you do is like, can I, can I just tell you, like, I'm a Laker fan. I'm not, I listen, I just, I don't watch your skin. I just look at the fact that you're fun to play and I enjoy watching you. So a, a lot of it is becoming that way. Again, uh, uh, whoever, whoever is going to play the role of a synergist, I don't think it's going to be one. I think it's going to be a lot of them. It's going to take a lot of courage. It's going to take a lot of wisdom. It's going to take a lot of tolerance. It's going to take a lot of understanding to be able to go through it. And there have to be a, a way to unify yet stand up to the bullies and where you address where the bullies are trying to play the manipulative game. I don't think you're going to win everybody over just like Abraham couldn't Lincoln could have won everybody over. But I think there's a group of people that are sitting around saying, can somebody say something? Cause I'm confused. Who's right right now? Cause everything well, I hear look, is this argument. You look in the past, you know, you used to have like, you know, the Republican party, for instance, you know, for a long time, kind of one of their models was, you know, we're the party of, you know, small government. I'm wondering if you're going to see, and who knows who the, the parties or the leaders that come out and say, you know, it's another word for, for small government or for small politics. Because both both parties right now are for big politics. Everybody's for big politics, sure. big politics. It's in your life everywhere. Who's for small politics? Like, I'm for small politics. If someone comes out and they're for small politics, like, they've got my support. Can you unpack small politics? That you should be able to live your life not walking around thinking about politics every single second of the day. That my my seven-year-old, you know, or my eight-year-old kid shouldn't be thinking about the politics of his movies or his TV ads yeah. or, uh, you know, that, like, we should just be free to, you're not free if you're thinking about politics all day, every day. And if you look at societies that are dysfunctional, it's when they become completely, every facet of the society is politicized. Yes. Societies that work, everything is in politics. You're free to just live your life. It's it's crazy you say that. I had, who's the recent, uh, is it the, the recent uh, commander of Space Force that was fired? Lohmeyer, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this, Matthew Lohmeyer, Lieutenant Colonel Lohmeyer, who was just recently fired. I had him on two weeks ago. And I said to him, I said, you know, when I was in the army, I don't remember anybody talking about politics. I was just in the army. I went in, I got out. It was like, cool. I mean, yeah, we watched war movies. We talked military. We talked Ike, you know, Grand. You're studying Patton. You're studying some of the wars. And some guys were deeply into it. But I don't remember like, hey, you're this. I don't, like, I can tell you. I was in the army for three years. And most people who joined the army are not uh, people who have money. So it's, yeah. I came from a broken family, so we didn't have a lot. My dad's a cashier out of 99 cents, so a Middle Eastern. So a lot of Hispanics, a lot of Blacks, a lot of low income from, you know, places. I don't ever remember racism. I tell you, I was there three years. I don't once remember even that word coming up in three years. And I'm asking yeah. this guy, like, oh, no, it's a completely different ballgame today. How much has this thing changed in 12 years? So, again, I like the small politics idea. Let a soldier be a soldier. Let an athlete be an athlete and create criteria where we're not being judged just because we're taking a certain position here. It's if you're if you're a Patriots fan, you're probably a Republican. You know, right. it's, it's like becoming like I'm just a Patriots fan. You know, I'm just like, if you like, if you like Tom, you know, if you like Tom Brady, you're probably a Republican. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. So, you know, if you're so rather than no, I like Tom Brady because the guy's got seven Super Bowl rings and the guy's a freaking monster running at 42, 43 years old. He ain't scared of nobody. And the guy's super competitive. That's why I like the guy. No, it's not why you like him. It's because this, you know, even flags. I'm in Florida. Everybody has American flag. If you have American flag, you're on one side politically. No, I just kind of, this country changed my life. So yes, I'm grateful for America. So again, I, I, I agree with you on the small politics side. I'd be so curious to know where these synergists are going to come and what Whoever is going to be able to unite America in the next couple of years, I mean, this person is going to be written about, talked about, studied for centuries to come because of what we have going on right now. But it's going to have to be a very, very strong character, human being that's not afraid, that can relate, that can communicate its message, and it can convert people over. I don't know who that's going to be, but I'm looking forward to seeing who that person is going to be. Elliot? I've had a blast with you. I hope the audience have, it's like, I almost feel like you and I had a coffee together and the audience got a chance to watch it. We just had a conversation together, which is great. Folks, if you haven't ordered his book yet, I'm going to put the link below to 2034 novel four of the next world war from Elliot Ackerman, former White House fellow Marine, served five tours of duty in Iraq, Afghanistan, where he received the silver star, bronze star for valor and purple heart. Elliot, thank you so much for your time. Take care, buddy. Thanks for having me. Pat. Yep. 2034, do you believe it? Can you visualize that taking place coming from a person with his kind of a resume with India, Iran, China, Russia, U.S., and the kind of 
you know, mistakes they're going to make with the miscalculations. Want to hear your thoughts, comment below. And can we have a synergist with today's climate, even though everyone's being censored? If you enjoy this interview, you may also enjoy two other interviews. I did one of them is with General Spaulding, who gave his presentation to the U.S. government on what China's vision was. He wrote a book about it called Stealth War. Stealth War, six months later he got fired. If you've not watched it, click over, you've got millions of views. The other one is with the former Space Force Lieutenant Colonel Commander Lohmeyer, who got fired recently. He gives his perspective of how much the military's changed in the last couple decades. If you wanna hear about that, click here. Having said that, take care everybody, bye-bye.